another good reason to be using um, the, the geodatabase. Leverage the geodatabase. Let ARC do all that work that it's very, very good at. Topology, it's good at. Okay, let the system do it for you. Okay? See how that works? GIS interaction type tools. <coughs> we have unions, we have intersects. This is from kind of the Venn diagram approach to it. Mathematical approach. And here is our intersect tool inside of ArcGIS. So what we have here is we have an input feature class shown in the blue, kind of a light colored blue. And then we have an intersect feature. That's our cookie cutter again. And uh, we're going to bring those two together for this output, uh, which looks like that kind of greenish colored semicircle near the bottom of this slide. The nice thing about the in uh, intersect tool is at one time, we can intersect and take one of our um, <coughs> um, we don't have to limit our analysis to just two layers at a time. We can throw in a lot of different stuff up inside here. In fact, we can assign ranks and which one's more important. It's a more powerful tool. Uh, and in this case, when we do an intersect, we care about the attributes of all of the feature classes that are involved. We do care about retaining uh, the attributes of the cookie cutter as well as those input features. Okay, Those are all intersect features. And we care about all that because now we're starting to ask questions about the relationship of this feature to this feature wherever they overlap and just where they, uh, just where they, uh, where they overlap. Okay, I said intersect. See how that works? So it's different, of course, from the clip. Here's a union tool which says, give me everything from everything. Put it all together, union them all together. And uh, what do we get, right? So we have all these input features again. Again, it doesn't have to be limited to just two. Uh, years ago when we were doing um, unions in Arc Info Workstation, the black box, we would do a union between two coverages get an output from that, and if we had to ultimately union 20 coverages together, we would union two of them, get the output, take the output from that, union it to another one, output from that, union it to another one, and keep going and going and going until we had all 20 put together. Okay. Now we don't have to do that. We can say, hey, put all 20 together at one point in time. And again, we care about the attributes from every one of these, typically we care about the attributes from every one of these uh, input feature classes. And it can get very, very complicated very, very quickly. I'll give you an example. We had a study area um, that was, it was up in Montana, the Garnett Mountain Range, which is just to the east of Missoula, Ovando, Montana area. So if some of you have been up that area, you can kind of visualize uh, where I'm talking about, and that kind of makes it maybe more interesting. Um, in that area, during the elk season, that elk hunting season, there is a, a, a hunting zone that's considered a walk-in only hunting area. And they have, oh, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm, I don't recall exactly anymore. I'll, I'll say that there was six, there were six um, gates where you, and then parking areas. You could park your vehicle there, uh, walk through the pass gate, and then go hunting inside that area. Six. Fairly large area. Um, and then what we did, kind of a neat thing, is we asked hunters to carry GPS units with them, turn it on in tracking mode, uh, let it record as long as the batteries will last, give us the GPS unit back, and we're going to, we want to understand how hunters hunt and how that then impacts the mortality of elk during the hunting season. And that, up until the time of the wolf release, the, the human hunters were the big um, for, uh, source of mortality for bull elk, especially. Okay, So you can kind of visualize what we were doing. So we had a bunch of hunters over, over the seasons who had volunteered to do this. 
And some hunters who, were, who used horses, that was all allowed, would tend to get quite a ways in. Other hunters who were just walking wouldn't get quite so far. And we noticed that, yeah, a lot of hunters don't want to get too far off the road either, you know. It, um, it's steep up there and it's more difficult terrain and so on. So I learned a lot of neat stuff about how hunters hunt. Um, and, uh, well, after a while you get an average distance. Um, um, and, and we went a little bit farther than that. We said, well, we know that 50% of the hunters get only this far away from the, um, the starting points, right, the, the entry areas. 75% of the hunters get this far, 95% of the hunters get that far, and so on and so forth. You can imagine that there's these kind of concentric rings, that only 5% of the hunters get way out to the deepest parts of this um, region. Okay? So for one of those individual gates where the hunters would start, you'd have, um, you know, maybe 50% of the hunters get out this far, another 10% get out this far, and ultimately you have these concentric rings, right? There's only six, only six of those um, areas where people can enter, the entry areas. And then when we started unioning all those things together, holy smokes, we had suddenly thousands of polygons that were created because of all the little overlaps and slivers that were created here and here. And uh, what it allowed us to do, however, is to calculate the average density, uh, hunter density, uh, at all these different parts of the study area because some hunters who really move a long ways might start overlapping their hunting area from a hunter who came from another area. And, it, and it, that, changes, that changed then the hunter density uh, for that uh, for that study area, uh, and it was very, really a, a very, very interesting uh, study to work on. And that was all done, of course, with unions. Unions were being used for that. So you can start off with what seems like a fairly simple uh, layer, feature class, and when you start unioning those things together, uh, it can become really complex very, very fast. So uh, just be ready for that if you get into that sort of analysis. The identity tool, we use it a lot. It's used tremendously by a lot of diff for a lot of different GIS type of applications. Um, and I think the best example of the identity tool would be where we take a point feature class. Um, we take a point feature class and ask, what polygon does this point fall into? Okay. So we're just doing that sort of overlay again. We'd have our input feature, vegetation, polygons maybe. Our identity feature, the location of radio collared elk. The location of GPS collared in today's world, livestock guardian dogs or mule deer, whatever, right? What, what type of habitat are they using? What type of vegetation cover are they using? We'd have an output feature class, but the interesting thing on an identity is that typically we don't care about the feature class. All we care about is the attribute table that gets produced for us. Okay? See that? We want to know, hey, what kind of veg, you know, forest has this elk been using, or this mule deer, or these sheep, what kind of stuff have they been using? That makes sense for you, extraction type of tools. Let's talk then about proximity tools. Buffer is the first we'll talk about. Now a buffer operation creates a polygon feature class where the perimeter of the polygon is set at a specified distance around a specific feature or features within another layer within a feature class. The distance can be constant. In other words, uh, let's go with our points again. A little bit easier to visualize, I suppose. Let's take those mule deer points. And we can say, well, I want to buffer every one of the mule deer points by 100 meters. Click it through, right? And then suddenly we see um, an output, an output feature class where we have these very uniform circles put around all of the individual 
mule deer points, and each one is exactly 100 meters in radius. Okay? Or we can vary the buffer distance using an attribute that is stored in that mule deer points feature class. How would we, and why would we ever want to use that? What do you think? Can you think of any application when we might want to use that? This be used for the use versus availability? Uh, how? Go, go continue your, your idea. Put the buffer around them saying this area they may vary within, but they're using this spot within this buffer area. I see. You might be able to. Yeah, that might help you out with that, right? How about this? Um, now here's another example. Um, let's say that we are, we have 10 elk, 10 mule deer, 10 livestock guardian dogs, whatever it happens to be, that are GPS collared. Unfortunately, not all the GPS collars are the same. Some of them are the latest and greatest uh, chipsets. Uh, some of them are a little bit older. And we know that the older um, GPS collars have an accuracy of plus or minus four meters. The newer collars uh, allow us to differentially correct and we're at plus or minus a meter. Okay? So what we could do is we could build an attribute into our mule deer points feature class. Call it <coughs> error. Okay? And instead of typing in pluses and minuses, because that would mean we'd have to use what type of data type? If we actually typed in plus slash minus, plus slash minus five, what would we have to use? What's that? No, no, no. What type of attribute would that be? What type of what type data type would that be? If we're going to type in, in, in a field, if we're going to type in plus slash minus five, text. Text, character, or string, right? Oh. Alphanumeric stuff. See that? Okay. But we know that we want to use this ultimately for the buffer tool. So we, we say, okay, we're, we're just simply going to put in a 5. And that means, and we write it up in our metadata, that the error field is a plus or minus whatever the value is. Plus or minus 5, that would mean. Some of our better collars, we would put a 1 in there. We might want to put a 0 0.5 if that was really the, the known accuracy of those individual GPS collars. Then what we could do is we could run a buffer on those um, mule deer points and include the error into it. So those mule deer that were wearing the older collars, we would then tell ARC to buffer it by five meters because we're not so sure of those older collars. Exactly where was that animal really? Okay, so we're going to buffer those by five meters. Then what we're going to do is those ones that are wearing, those mule deer that are wearing the newer collars, accuracy of one meter, we're going to buffer those points by one meter. Now, if we had previously gone through um, and, and, t and took all those mule deer points and did an identity on those mule deer points onto the vegetation cover, we would then say that um, maybe the majority, 75% of the mule deer locations were found in Douglas fir forests. 10% were here, 15% were there, whatever. But then, after we do the buffer, 5 meters, 1 meter, whatever, we could take those buffered locations, polygons, and do an identity with those onto the veg. And then what we might find out is, hold on. A lot of those animals must have been on the edge because now only 60% of the mule deer are inside the Douglas fir and part of their buffers fall into ponderosa pine or whatever. Some sort of different answer. Which one's right? Which of those analysis would be right? You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. They're both equally correct because you're working within the known error of that instrument, the GPS collars. Okay. So there's another application of the buffer tool. And of course, it's not just natural resources. It's just that's the example that I'm using here in this class. Lots of applications for buffers. Another application for you in more the municipal world, geomatics type of thing, is uh, as you know, I'm